Today we're going to take a little bit of a detour because some data types have even more structure than just functors and this structure has an impact on how the values and the operations behave inside the instances of a given data type. So capturing something like what it means to be an array or a list or a container or an option, this is something that our type systems can do in an exhaustive way. Like they, can cap they can capture every detail of what it means to be an option and what it means to be a container or an array or a list or these things. On the other hand, our type systems, uh, they cannot easily, or in some cases they cannot at all, encode information like we have uh, uh, maybe an array of values and the, and the values need to be sorted. So you cannot put a bigger value before a smaller value. This, this is, is not something we can guarantee with the type system. And we're now going to dive into one of these extra structures on values, which is monoids. Uh, so, yeah, and then we're going to lift this definition of what a monoid is. Monoid is a, is a, is a term that sounds very mathematical, but um, in an intuitive sense, monoids are all things that can be combined together uh, in a way that is independent of which operations you do first, as long as you do them from left to right. And then we're going to apply this definition, which in the beginning we're going to see as a very simple definition. We're going to apply it to uh, our functors. We are going to apply it to, uh, to, to, to our generic types and the structures themselves, rather than the simple primitive values that we manipulated in the first examples. And this will give rise to the single most powerful a programming pattern that is known to humanity. And even though the sentence itself is quite epic, this is the kind of reasoning and this is the kind of background that led people to the discovery and engineering of things like link, of promise, async await, uh, list comprehensions, and a lot of other things that yeah, haven't been discovered by accident, but have rather been discovered within the context of this kind of theoretical framework. So, let's dive into it. Uh, so, monoids. Okay, uh, let's consider a very simple example of numbers. We know that numbers support some operations with important properties, with special elements which behave in a very special way with respect to the operation. So, uh, so we're now going to focus on the following. We're now going to focus on number. The operation is plus. And what is the special element that we can think of when dealing with addition? It's zero. And what we call zero is the identity of plus. Now, what does, what does it mean that zero is the identity? Well, because we know that it doesn't matter which value x we pick, this is equal to zero plus x, which is equal to x. So doing plus zero, so the function uh, x that goes into x plus zero, this is actually the identity function because it takes as input a value x and gives us x itself even though it spends maybe a little bit of time calculating something around x but the calculation inevitably yields the fact as well we get to the same value and of course this is equal to uh, fun x that goes into 0 plus x so it doesn't matter on which side we, we take x and we put on the left something uh, zero things more or on the right, we put zero things more, we always end up at x. And I also really like this uh, this, this definition here because I, I like this definition in terms of uh, function equality because it is uh, very much in harmony with the rest of the framework of our lectures. 
Now, let's take a look at another example. We could say we have number, but now we take multiplication and we take value 1. And 1 is the identity of multiplication. So we can say x times 1 is equal to 1 times x. Again, it doesn't matter on which side. Uh, and we could also rephrase this in a in a functional way. I'm, I'm going to do it, even though it's a, it's a bit trivial at this point. So the function that takes as input x and returns x times 1 is the identity, because it takes as input x and gives us x back, even though it wastes a little bit of time doing an operation that doesn't change x at all. And it doesn't really matter uh, on which side we multiply, on which side we multiply, x times one and one times x will both yield just just x. Now, so we have a type. We have an operation that takes two values from this type and compacts them together, and we have this neutral element or identity element. What else can we say about this kind of structure? So this is, well, yeah, in a, in a, in a, in, in quite a strong sense, this is an extra, uh, an extra structure with uh, laws that we're imposing on a triplet of a type, an operation, and one special element. What extra structure do we have? Well, we have another bit of extra structure. Let's say that we have three values, a, b, and c. And we say, OK, first you add a and b, and then you add c to the result. Or you say, no, no, first you add b and c, always left to right, of course. So we're not swapping things around. Uh, and, then, and then you do a plus the result of b plus c. Well, these are the same, and actually not only are they the same, but they are so much the same, it doesn't really matter where you put the brackets, to the left or to the right, you can do this operation in any order you want. Just order the order in which you group things in pairs can be anything you want. So you could also say that if you have a, a, a plus b plus c plus d, you say, okay, you can do it like this, or you can do it like this, or you can do it like this, the result will always be the same. Because the idea of combination, as long as we go from left to right, because we don't want to screw the potential order of things, but the order in which you click things together and pour them together, this order doesn't matter. I do wonder if this also applies to multiplication. So what if we have a times b times c? And first we multiply a times b. And then we multiply the result by c. Or we say no, first we multiply b times c, and then we multiply on the left with a. Well, of course, these things are the same, and in the result, we usually don't even bother to put between brackets. All right. But number is absolutely not the only data type supporting such a structure. Uh, because now we have, okay, the identity operation, and we have the associ uh, associativity, oh my god, associativity, <laughs> it's not a word I write often, and yeah, together these things, they identify a relatively small subset of the triplets, so you cannot just take a type an operation on two elements of the type and an element and say, oh yeah, this, this works. So it's, it's actually a very small subset of all the combinations of all types, binary operations and single elements. And still, it's an infinite set of such uh, triplets. So it's infinite, but it's a lot less than all the possible combinations. So we're talking about different uh, um, cardinalities here. We're talking about infinites, but they are not necessarily uh, of the same size. Number is not the only data type that supports such a structure, as I was saying, because indeed uh, anything where we can combine things in a, in a, in a well-structured way is possibly a monoid. Let's take, for example, string. The concatenation operation of strings, which is written like a plus, is not uh, the same uh, interpretation of plus, and the empty string, which in our case ends up 
acting like the zero for numbers. And now we could say that the empty string is the identity of plus. And we can ask, okay, but what about does x plus the empty string, where x is a string, is this equal to x? Of course, and this is equal to empty string plus x. How about associativity? If I say a plus b plus c, and these are three strings, is this equal to a plus b plus c? Of course it is. This is where I mentioned the left to right is important. With numbers this is not immediately evident because numbers are just a bunch of ones next to each other and then you can you, you, you could swap the order and that's okay. So plus also has a property which is not monoidal, uh, which is a plus b is equal to b plus a, but this is in general not true and therefore is also absolutely not something we want to deal with when it comes to monoids. For strings, uh, a plus b is not equal to b plus a. So this is not true. By a long shot, not true that a plus b is equal to b plus a. Because of course you change the um, of course you change the order in which you combine the strings and you just don't get the same string. Alright. Multiplication doesn't really exist in strings, so we don't really have an equivalent of the number multiplication. Arrays, on the other hand, arrays with the same type, but they do support this very same structure. So we could say that an array of an arbitrary element A concat and the empty array, well, the empty array is the identity of concat, makes sense. So why? Because if I have an array and I say concat with the empty array, well, this is the same as x, but we could also say that the empty array concatenated with x yeah, also gives us the same value x. Also, if I have three arrays and I say a dot concat of b dot concat of c, and is this equal to a dot concat of b dot concat of c? Well, of course it is. And again, here the left to right is very important. So we can't swap things because if you concatenate two arrays, then of course you do not get the same concatenation. You get the same elements. Just like for a string, you would get the same characters as a result. But you definitely do not get the same the same uh, string if you swap, and you definitely don't get the same array if you swap the order in which you concatenate the elements. Concat is a function, so here we don't have the variation without the brackets, so we can say a dot concat uh, b dot concat c. So yeah, that's uh, that's that's. No, I'm not going to say it's a PT because I mean, who cares? But languages like F Sharp, they do have a, a custom operator, so you could also define plus to concatenate arrays. And I have to say, I always get a little bit of a of a hardcore rush when uh, when doing uh, when doing this kind of thing. All right. So in short, we can find this kind of structure in many data types, and this structure is the monoidal structure, which means that these types, operations, and values always follow the same set of basic rules of behavior, even if the data types themselves are very different from each other, because what is the relationship between number, multiplication, and one from array, concat, and empty array? There is no relationship whatsoever, and yet, the fact that the same design pattern arises. Oh, that is indeed very interesting. Hmm. So let's try to define the pattern. Now, we have a data type, well, a type T. We have a composition operation, which I will call uh, with, with like plus between sort of brackets, because I want to make clear this is not just plus, it's, it's a custom operation. It can, be, it can be multiplication of numbers, it can be concatenation of arrays, it can be one of many things. So yeah, I like to use a symbol that contains a plus in it, because that's kind of reminiscent of the fact that the simplest monoid is this one, number plus and zero, but I also want to add some weird symbols that remind us 
well, it's also not just plus. It can be, it's, it's a weird plus, but it's still kind of like a plus because it's, it puts things together, you know? It preserves the information of the two elements and if possible, also the order. So this is the most simple way to su superpose two values together. We have an identity element. Um, e of t or z of t, z can su suggest a zero, e just, just an element, i for identity, doesn't really matter what we call it, underscore element with no name, we are not going to do this but yeah, that could be fun. And then the following must hold for t weird plus and e to be a monoid. So the monoid laws. First one, a plus e is equal to e weird plus a, which is equal to a for each a in t. So any value of a in t, you combine it on both, on either side with the identity element, it gives you itself back. And then a weird plus b weird plus c, doesn't matter the order, as long, sorry, doesn't matter the association, the result is always the same. Order matters, the association, so where do we put the brackets? does not. For each a, b and c in t. So it doesn't matter which elements we, we, we picked. All elements support the same laws. All right. Now, this definition, which is the definition you would find in most textbooks, is not particularly useful for us as software engineers. Because if you think about our framework so far, our framework is a framework of functions. Functors are characterized by the map function, which is characterized by how it transforms a function that we give as argument into a new function that we give as a new argument. And all these things being functions, they can be composed with the then operator. So in this sense, in this sense, we would like to rephrase all of this in functional terms. And these definitions are identical. So I'm going to pick this definition. And I'm going to say we have a type T. Well, the composition operation, that's nice. It's already, well, let's give it a type, actually. It takes as input a T uh, and another T. And it returns a new T. So this is covered. Well, almost covered because our functions, our functions, they do kind of tend to take a single parameter as input. So you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to define a new type, a pair. So I'm going to say, no, no, the composition operator has to be a function, one of our functions from hmm, a pair of two t's. It's kind of the same as saying it's a function that takes two t's as two parameters. And I say, no, no, it takes one parameter, but inside the parameter are two t's next to each other. So this makes sense. The identity element, well, we can say, okay, this is a function from the unit type. Let me check that we actually have it. Yes, we have the unit type. It's this type that doesn't really contain any values. So it kind of represents void. And I can say, okay, the identity element, you don't really have to, it's a function. You don't really give it anything. So it will always give you the same value, which is, well, this value in the previous definition. And we can even, well, you could imagine that this is a get zero and this is the, the join function because it joins two values together into, uh, into the same result. And at this point I'm wondering whether or not uh, you fully know what pair is, so I'm, I'm going to offer an implementation of pair. So pair of uh, A and B is very simply A and B together. So that's it, there's nothing special, just the two values. And this is not an array, this is a tuple. So the elements, if they have different types, well, let me show you. If I say that x 
a type pair of number and string then I cannot say okay this is a string and this is a string like I get a compiler error on the first value because yeah this is supposed to be a number if I say okay I want more well more also doesn't work because here you see I, I get an error that says no 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 so the type that, that has been given which is ah uh, I cannot go, okay, whatever, type number string number is not assignable to type pair number of string because, yeah, the source has three elements, but the target allows only two. So don't be fooled, these are not arrays, they are tuples. All right, so what happens to the identity law? Well, the identity law then becomes uh, the join um, of A. Well, we have to put them together, so A and get zero and you can see that I have to put this in uh, in the array this is the same as join of get zero a which is the same as a okay cool now we could also say that okay so if we want to rephrase this as uh, an equivalence to the identity we could say that, okay, a function that takes as input a and returns join of a get zero is equal to the identity, which is equal to the function that takes as input a and returns join of get zero of a. We actually could consider this to be a rather sophisticated form of composition, so uh, because you could say that actually yeah this is kind of fun so if we focus on on this bit i'm not going to write the actual code for it but imagine that you have a constructor for a pair that takes as input a value and applies like a, an initialization value and passes it to, to, to two functions that give us the values and so we could say that we have make pair and make pair we pass it the things to do to the two to, to, to the to the same value so get zero and identity and then join and this is the same as the identity the cool thing about this well you know what i'm going to show you so make pair is this genetic generic function takes as input a, co a context and produces a pair of a and b uh, and this returns a function from this initialization context into pair of a and a and b for now let's say null no exclamation mark it is happy and what we take are two functions the one to initialize the left value which is a function from c to a and we want to initialize the right value which is a function from c to b okay how do we do this well it's actually quite simple we get the value of c as input and then we return the pair where we call l of uh, the context and r of the context <laughs> all right so uh, let's define our instance of uh, get zero, for example, for uh, for this monoid here. Yes. So, uh, well, mm, const uh, string uh, plus. So this will be our monoid, and we say that um, well, the join operation will take us will take as input the two strings. So. Um, well, this will be a function takes as input the first string oh sorry the the pair of strings so uh, s1 and s2 which are a pair of string and string and this returns oh, I need brackets s1 plus s2 so just concatenates them in the order in which we got them we have get zero which is a function from um, a value that we ignore of type unit into empty string 
Now, let's see if the thing is happening. So can I say make pair of string plus dot get zero identity, uh, which I have to call, then, okay, uh, then string plus dot join. Oh, oh no, okay. Let's see. Mm. This is mildly disappointing. Let's take a look at uh, at what Dan is expecting of us. So let's take a, an input. Okay. Now why does it say it's a pair string null? No, 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 no. We really want. Wait a second. Yeah, fun null and string. Okay. Hmm. Wait a second. So what is the type of this? Takes as input null. Ah! Oh! Ah, this is brilliant. No, 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 no. This is identity of string, of course. Ah, but okay. Let me rephrase. Instead of null, we are going to take uh, an empty object. Yes, because null is too specific. Now, an empty object will accept anything. This is a better definition of unit in TypeScript. So now, okay, this is unit pair of string unit. Okay, so getting there. Now I'm going to try to force it to be a string, and now it's happy. Because basically, we get a string, which is the, well, which is actually going to be this value here, this value of a, we pass it to get zero, and get zero just ignores it and gives us the empty string back. We also pass the string to the identity, and the string is kept. So now we have two things, empty string and the string we had as input. So this gives us a pair of string string, followed by a string last dot join. Now it is happy because, well, this thing produces um, goes from a string to two strings, one of which is zero and the other is the string we got as input, and then we join them together. So this really is, uh, let's say, const uh, pointless path one. This really gives us the very same string back. And then pointless path two is simply the opposite. So uh, first we do identity, and then we do get zero. So we get as input a value this value that we called a here. But it's implicit now, that's the very cool thing about this. We pass it to the identity of string, so the left side of the pair is the value we passed. We also pass it to get zero, which just ignores it, because whatever you pass it, it will always give you the zero elements. Now we have two values, the input, a, and the empty string. And then what do we do? Well, we put them in a pair, and then we join them. And both these things are identical to the identity. Let's verify this. Uh, let's call uh, pointless path one with ABC. Uh, and let's uh, run this. So node bin out. Uh, and we get ABC. Okay, good stuff. Then pointless path two of ABC. Of course, it also returns ABC. Uh, ABCD. Uh, now, in this case, uh, so for this one, well, I'm going to rephrase this now, join of A and B, joined with C, will be the same as join of A with join of B and C, and we don't really have this kind of syntax anymore. But we could say, okay, so hmm, this is a little bit more complicated because we could say, all right, so if we have a triplet of A, B, and C, um, then the order in which we fold the triplet is um, the order in which we fold the triplet is uh, doesn't change. This is actually quite tough to, to restructure. Um, this is quite tough to restructure, but we're going to do it anyway, because a pair is also somewhat functorial. So I'm going to define map 
dub, double map of pair. So now I take a pair of A and B and two transformations A to A1, B to B1. And so I need all of these generic parameters. The left transformation takes A into A, A1. The right transformation takes B into B1. And this is a function from a pair of AB into a pair of A1, B1. And now I take as input the first pair, let's call it P, and what I produce is, uh, well, L of P of 0 and R of P of 1. Okay, mm. so this is the mapping of a pair. Now, say that I have a... Um, uh, a pair with another pair inside. So I have a value, let's call it uh, uh, double pair one, which has type pair of, well, number and pair of number, number. Because I do need three numbers in the beginning, so that's why I need the three pairs. And, uh, okay, whatever, one and then two and three together. Okay. So what I could do here, I could say, okay, I can. What can I do with PP one? Well, I could say uh, map two pair of. Uh, okay, so the left is going to be string plus. Oh, sorry, I only have strings. So let's do it with strings. String, string, and string, and let's say this is A, this is B, and this is C. Okay, so I can say now uh, string plus dot join and identity. Okay, and actually let's take a look at what, what this pipeline does. And let's call it F. Okay, so this takes as input a pair of pair of string and unknown. So it knows that, okay, the first... So I swap them around. ID and string plus. That doesn't matter because we're going to do the symmetrical one in a moment. So uh, this takes as input. Well, the first value is unknown because it has no clue. It's just we gave the identity, so it doesn't know what the first value is. The second value, you can see it's a pair of string string, but the result is pair of unknown because that unknown is kept with the identity and then string. Okay. What if we say then string plus dot join? Okay, let's take a look. Okay, now, now clearly it doesn't know, so let's force it to acknowledge that uh, also that unknown is actually a string. Now this goes from a string, so a pair of a string and a pair of a string and a string, so three strings, just one and two grouped together, into a single string. First we join the two on the right, and then we join the other, and then we join the two results. Okay, so can I uh, invoke this? Of course I can, so console.log, and I can take f and call it with pp1. Notice that everything is happy, we run it, and it took a, b, and c, and it concatenated them together. And now I could say, okay, what about the other path? So what if I say no, I, I group together the first two values, and so this is going to be a and b, and the last value is just going to be c. Okay. Now, of course, because I have the first value of the first pair, which is a pair, I have to join that and preserve the second value. And this goes from pair of string, string, into just a pair of string, string. And then I join that. And so now the type, you can see, is a pair of pair of string, string, string. So the first two strings are grouped together in a pair. And the second string, uh, sorry, the third string is just the second element of the first pair. And we combine all of these things together. And one could say, okay, but I mean, you're kind of cheating because, well, actually, this should have been perhaps called a, a PP2. Um, and, oops. And we have these now two different types. So how, how do we cope with this? And one could, say, could argue that these two values, well, they can be converted by a swap operator. So, yeah, you can always uh, you can always flip. Like if you have a if you have a triplet, then you can always 
flip the triplet and, and, and swap the association. I'm going to show you what this looks like. So let's say that we have uh, uh, the uh, associate function. We have A, B, and C. This takes as input. Uh, and let's say this takes as input a pair of A and then a pair of B and C. And this returns a pair of a pair of a pair of a and b and c so they're just grouped differently now what we get as input is wait a second a and b and c and what we return well we just flip them around is a b and c all right so if i take this as the second uh, as the second path to the permutation and i restore the first one now f1 is pair of string, pair of string string into string, and f2 is pair of pair string 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 into string. And these are different types, so we cannot just state that they are the same. But what if I want to be able to have one of them get the input of the first one? So what if I said, oh wait, this, this is going to be tough. Um, well, there are only two options. So I'm going to see if I if I can get lucky. If that's the case, we will not think about it. Uh, so let me see. String, string, string. I got lucky. Like, because <laughs> my plan was to try both of them. <laughs> One of them is going to complain. Okay, so now F1 takes as input pair string and then pair string string, which is sort of now our canonical form because we have to pass them in the same order to both functions and in this case we take pair string of pair string string and then we flip it around and we pass it with this other structure and but we've reformulated this without the values a b and c just as a form of function equality based on uh, the utilities of pair and the utilities of pair are generic so they don't depend on the monoid like this bit here has nothing to do whatsoever with monoids I, I, if you ask me this is actually very pretty to be honest like very 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 pretty because uh, also uh, the more you do this kind of thing the more you sort of get a weird allergy to to these parameters like these parameters like a or these floating values like a b and c and then you discover that there's all all these utilities that manipulate higher order functions so that you're not required ever again anymore to to invent names for these small parameters for smaller operations because everything is these pipelines and everything is based on composing and comparing pipelines and you do get used to this like at some point this feels more natural than the alternative and I, I don't know if at that point you, you, you could conclude that your brain has been slightly screwed up by this or whether or not you have reached another level of enlightenment when it comes to coding but uh, yeah honestly I don't know you know what type monoid uh, of T uh, well what's, what's a monoid going to be well there's going to be Let's generalize this. You are right. Thank you. Let's give it a proper type. Join will have to be a function. Well, you know what? We have this already. So how about function from pair of tt into t and then get zero. And well, also, how about this? From, oops, from unit to t. And now at least we can say that string plus is a monoid over string. So this, this would be the type of string plus. And then we can we have at least captured the type of monoid. Uh, we could also use the very same trick we used for the for the functor repository at the end of, uh, of, of last lesson and uh, create a repository of monoids for composition, but it might be a little bit too much. But at least now we get neat compiler errors that help us a little bit. So yes. There you go. I'm Thank also, you. 
I'm also going to show something else actually, because we said that these laws apply to um, to all monoids, and we know that number plus is indeed a monoid. So these expressions about uh, how how do you actually validate the um, the laws of monoids? You can see that I'm just putting the other monoid, and this thing still works. And also here, these two long pipelines. Well, if I change the type and change the monoid instance, this still compiles. And not only does it still compile, but it still behaves in the same way. And I hope this feels as mind-blowing as it's supposed to, because now I have the guarantee that I, 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 I plugged in a pretty different data structure, because number plus and string plus are very different, and still these two paths that we have here, these two, and also these two are exactly the same, will behave the same, they are identical no matter which monoid we put in there. And if you think about it, this is the core of what we do as software engineers because we want to capture patterns as they arise over and over again. That's what we want to do as software engineers. That's the whole trick. And through category theory and mathematics and functional programming, we are given a golden opportunity and a golden guideline on how to capture patterns um, in a well-behaved way. And when I when I copied number plus instead of string plus, I didn't think I just knew had an absolute mathematical guarantee. And this was going to work. There was no way that this would not work. And so you remove complexity. You remove complexity from your own thinking about properties and code, etc. There's a lot less inventing things yourself. And there's a lot more leaning on the underlying, let's say, mathematical reality of things. And I like this, because this brings correctness to our code. Our discussion, okay, so our discussion on monoids so far was based on these very concrete data types that we manipulate on a daily basis, like strings, numbers, arrays, etc. And we saw the repeating pattern, we captured it, we understood its general properties. So not only just the shape, but we also managed to capture these uh, these general properties because they can be a way to perform some uh, optimizations especially when concatenating uh, perhaps arrays etc these monoidal laws can give rise to for example some some simplifications in code because you know if you have a zero there's no reason to actually concatenate it uh, with other things which is an optimization I had to do recently in practice because I had a chain of functions and I realized instead of tracking of starting with zero, I tracked the zero as undefined to avoid having a chain of compositions with, with identity. So implicitly I was using basically this uh, idea of, uh, of, of the neutral element and that you can skip compositions uh, and then yeah, this saves you a little bit of computational time. The idea of understanding the type, understanding the structure, capturing it as much as possible is so that the compiler and the language and the libraries we build can do the thinking for us. So we do it once, we explain this thinking to the library and then it does the thinking for us from them on uh, without having to reinvent the wheel every single time. So like you just implement this type, you think about the properties and then that's it. You can you can trust that a monoid will always behave the same way and you can even define some function that well actually I'm, I am just going to take this uh, this identity here and you could say const uh, um, ident identity law and we could say well this is a generic function that takes as input a monoid m uh, in the type t and what does it do? Well, it takes these parts. It takes these parts. Well, of course, I need to get uh, uh, m dot get zero id of t m of join. Hey, why is it unhappy? Uh, 
I'm surprised by this. Hmm. Well, okay. Let's get to the bottom of this. Let's get zero. Goes from unit to t. ID of t. Hmm. Let's give it a ah. <laughs> Come on, which types don't extend? Okay, somewhat silly. Or we will see if maybe I made some uh, some mistake. But anyway, uh, and then I could say, okay, let's verify the identity on a bunch of, of samples. And uh, the samples will be uh, an array of values of type T. And now I could say, okay, then uh, samples not for each. Uh, then we have a sample s, and we have to verify that. Uh, uh, well, we want to, uh, if s is different from pointless path one of s, then console dot error uh, m is not a monoid because we have a we have an example that it's not the case and if it's not equal to the pointless path 2 then we can state that m is not a monoid and we can even say no we we, we stop everything well no without time not going to waste time on this okay and then i could say okay let's verify the identity law on uh, number and on um, number plus and let's say one, two, three, four, five. Okay. And it's happy. Okay. And let's define a borked monoid which returns one on addition. This is not a monoid. And let's uh, call it on borked monoid. Yeah. That's one, so that doesn't doesn't work because one plus one is not one. So adding one is a uh, uh, is not the identity. Okay, what about uh, the string plus? Well, let's see. Let's give a bunch of strings a, a, b, c, and the empty string as well can be a good test. A, b, c, d. Of course, this needs to be the, the identity law invoked on strings. And no, of course, this is a, of course this is a, this is a, a proper string monoid. If on the other hand we were to break the string monoid by adding an underscore, well, no, M is not a monoid. Of course, it isn't. All right. Now let me remove the Borg monoid, or at least uh, comment it out, so our code only contains things that are proper. But the very cool thing is that by capturing the pattern of monoid, we can also perform some automation or we can even accept the monoid as a parameter and as you've seen well minus of course the the generic argument which I would hope yeah okay it can be inferred um, we can pass the monoid as a parameter and uh, have an algorithm that depends on a monoid for example uh, this this would be the foundation for having an application where you can swap out uh, containment data structures if you have a reason to want to have maps, sets, arrays, or lists, then you would extract the properties, the, the fundamental properties of these data structures as your algorithm needs them into something that will look a lot like this monoid type. So what we're also seeing here is how to extract some operations in an interface of operations that you can then pass to uh, a higher order algorithm like identity law in our case. So it's not just about the monoid, but secretly we're also seeing broader patterns for generalization, which is also kind of a cool thing. And this is the power of capturing, naming, and representing patterns in our libraries. And now we're going to extend our pattern. We have monoids on these simple data types, but what if we could take these monoids that appear everywhere and generalizing them in terms of a functor f. All right, so let's take the definition of monoids. 
let's take uh, let's take the functional definition of monoids and let's say that now we start with a functor f so something like type f of a is equal blah 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 and also map f which you know takes as input a function from a to b and returns a function from f of a into f of b okay so this is the functor this is what we have for the functor all right let's start with the identity element now well this this we could say hmm all right now the let's say canonical representation of get zero as a function from unit to t this is what we had before so this goes from no information because unit contains no information all units are empty and identical to each other so they don't discriminate in any way so they don't contain any information because information allows us to to discriminate information allows us to see differences from no information to to the information of a single value of type t because t became f and of course this is going to be f of of a so get zero will definitely be generic but unit also has to change because what f is is structure so this doesn't go from no information to information this goes from no structure into structure so this go from the identity factor let's see if we have the identity factor yes we do the identity factor has no structure so we go from the identity factor which is the same as saying just get the value of type a but i i, I really want to keep this um this definition is a little bit better and takes the value of a so the the functor without structure and puts the structure around it and because this is actually just a into f of a this is a constructor of f like the the simplest constructor takes as input a value and puts it in the structure and every functor supports such a thing we can create a value with one element create a list with one element uh, create the option that's not empty create the container with count zero and the element and so on this is the simplest constructor because when we have a functor a monoidal functor represents really a box of values like functors that can be constructed get zero is very common actually also functors that are not fully monoidal usually can be initialized somehow the composition operator oh this is a lot tougher because this says okay we have the information of t contained twice what will this mean well this certainly doesn't mean that we have uh, f of a and f of a twice into f of a because we don't have two f of a's because that doesn't mean that we have twice the information of f f represents a structure so in order to have this structure twice i need to nest them so here i am saying i get the box within the box so there are two layers of functorial structure and we flatten them into one Hmm. All right. Now. Now. Well, all right. So the associativity and identity laws will become uh, will also become equivalences uh, quite similar to the functional equivalences we had. So this I'm going to call unit now, because 
there is no relationship anymore, intuitively speaking, with zero. So unit or even comms could even be better. I'm going to keep join. Join is okay, it's common, but this is much more often encountered as unit, also in other programming languages. Now, um, so let's take a look at the identity law. For the identity law, what are we saying? We're saying, okay, uh, we start with an f of a, then in order to be able to join, we need to turn this into an f of f of a, and then we join it again into f of a, and this has to be, ident and this has to be the identity. So how do we do this? Well, we take the unit, and we basically pass it f of a, because, well, the unit will simply take whatever value, and we can even give it an instance of the functor itself. So whatever comes in, we take it and we just put another structure of it. Like if you have an array and you call unit with the array and this just puts another array around it. So it goes from an array with let's say 50 elements to an array of arrays with just one element with 50 elements inside. And then we join. And well, this takes the array of arrays and then just whoop, uh, concatenates it. Uh, but well, actually there's only one array to concatenate. So we get the very same uh, the very same result. But also, we could say, all right, so let's say that we have this f of a, there are actually two ways to put the structure. We can put the structure around or we can put it inside. So you can say, okay, but what about, uh, what if you take map of f and for every value of f of a, you embed that value into a box. So you put a unit around it. And this goes from f of a to f of f of a, but instead of wrapping the box in a box, it opens the box, takes the value out, puts the value in a box, puts it back in the original box, and you still get a box in a box, but it's kind of the other way around. So instead of wrapping inside, you're wrapping outside, or instead of wrapping outside, you're wrapping inside. And of course, then, then you just join. And this has to be the same as the identity. And you can see this is a very similar definition, by the way, to the, to the original one. And, well, for association, we have, well, okay, yes. And for association, well, now we need to have f of f of f of a. And then, well, what do we join? Well, okay, so imagine we have an array of array of arrays. We can join, we can flatten the first two. Or we can flatten the second and third, and we get to f of f of a, and then this we flatten again of f of a, and it doesn't matter which of the two paths we follow, we, we always get to the same result. So we can say, all right, now, in one case I just join, then join. This joins the first and the second, and then joins the result with the third. Or I can say no, first I map of join, so I join inside the first, so the first I leave untouched and I join the second and third, then I join and these two things are the same. <laughs> All right, this feels abstract and it also is. That's why in the second course of software engineering, we're actually going to rephrase this in category theory, and we're actually going to see that this is easier to talk about in a more mathematical framework. But for now, for now, we're going to see a few examples of monoidal functors, or as we like to say at parties, monoidal functors are just monads. Now, now, let's uh, let's take a look at. Well, let's start with a let's start with a with my favorite monad as an example. Option. Let's turn option. Let's turn option into into a monad. So the option monad will contain. Well, we want to uh, get zero and join. Uh, actually, unit and join. Unit will uh, take as input. Well, we, we, is, is a, actually, I think I can just say. Ah, 
Oh, nice. I have the whole constructor thingy. Okay. So, uh, unit is just full. See, it's this constructor. It takes as input a value of type A, and there is an option of A. Okay, cool. So, um, can I wrap this into a function? Option dot default dot full. What? Ah, no, we need a. Uh, okay. So, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to make this generic. So that the system actually knows that we're dealing with. Okay, so let's see. Unit. So basically, I've made it lazy because first you have to call it, and unit you call it, but that specifies the generic parameter. Okay. And then we're going to get join. Join we have to define. Join, join, join we actually have to define manually. Unit is very often already found in most functors because we need a way to initialize them and it's quite common to have a way to initialize a functor either as empty or with at least one value. And in some cases there is not even the possibility of having it empty like the container so it's quite likely that for the container we would already have a similar constructor more or less ready. In the case of join, on the other hand, oh, this is a lot tougher. So this will be a function that takes as input option of option of A, and we return a single option of A. Now, I take the O2 option of option, and this is actually custom work. Like the definition of a monad requires a deep ad hoc understanding of the data structure that we are actually flattening. What does it mean to flatten this? So, if we are empty, well, there is no content, like the outer option is empty already, so, well, I can't really return O2, well, can I? Well, the system might be smart enough, but I'm going to make this explicit anyway. I'm going to say option.default.empty. I just want to get an empty, uh, an empty option. Otherwise, well, there's the content, which is an option of A, or there you go. So basically, I peeled one layer of option. So, there are three alternatives. This one, the first one, is empty. Okay, then there are no values. So, I, if it's empty, that's it. We're done. If the outer is empty, then I'm done. Otherwise, the outer is not empty. Yeah, then, we, then the inner can be empty or full. I could also make this a little bit too explicit. I could say, okay, if the inner is empty, then, okay, once again, the result is empty because I don't have any value. Otherwise, I can return option default.full of o2.content.content. .content. I think this is a little bit too much, but for illustration purposes, it's okay. We can just leave it here. It doesn't cause any, any damage. And now option is a monad because option is already a functor, it has map, uh, and uh, it has map, and it has unit, and it has join, and we also know it respects these, uh, these laws. Okay, now, I could also say that a monad uh, takes as in, is a type that takes as input f, and then it has a unit which returns apply of f to a and join which well I'm going to copy this and I'm going to replace option with apply uh, apply f to a, apply f to a, and this applies f to the result of the application. Okay, now let's see if I can say that this is a monad of a functor of option. Oh no, such a disappointment. Oh no, of course, of course, this is a function from uh, I apply um, okay let's start easy okay so from a to f of a I could also just say identity of a and I could also say I guess apply functor identity to a
No, I'm missing something. Oh! Yes! <laughs> and we have even captured our definition of monad thanks to the apply function that we had defined um, that we had defined uh, when capturing functors. So you can see that our framework keeps growing. It's it's like a pyramid, you know, and, and, and it doesn't matter how many layers we keep adding, we're kind of adding layers on at the bottom, you know, it's like we lift the pyramid, put something underneath, and then it's still a pyramid, but it's just one level higher. Ah, this is so cool, so exciting. <laughs> Okay, um, now one very cool thing I want to show you is that actually when we encounter monads in real life, they tend to have another parameter, uh, another, um, they tend to have another uh, operator. This operator is called bind or then. Um, I'm going to call it then actually. Now let me show you how then works in um, how then works for for option. Well, let me check that we didn't add it already. No, we didn't. Okay, very good. Uh, so then for option, we'll take as input. Well, as a first parameter. Let's call it uh, the the first program, the first uh, the first value, and this is an option of a. The second parameter f will be um, well. I'm not going to use our uh, our function definition because I actually just want to be able to pass normal functions. So a function f from a into an option of b, where b is another parameter. So what does this mean? This means that I have an option of a, which mind you might be empty, and a function that would really like to run on the content of a, if there is such a thing. And if we pass it an a, it gives us an option of b. And finally, we get an option of b as a, res as a, re as a result. Okay. Uh, let's see, let's see, let's see. So we have P and we have F. What can we do? Well, let's define P prime as, well, why not? Map option. And what we pass? Well, how about we pass uh, our function F? Um, oh, it wants a fun. Well, no problem. We, we wrap it into fun. Okay. So what is P1 now? Okay, it goes from option of A into option of option of B. Okay, interesting. I could say, okay, then after this, you have an option of option of B. What do we do? How about we take the option monad and we join the result? Okay, so what do we have now? We have something that takes, oh, an option of A into an option of B. Oh, this is exciting. Because now we can simply say, okay, now we want an option of A. Let's get, let's give it P, and the result here is, oh, an option of B, which by the way is exactly what we wanted, so we can return it. And, well, not just return it, let's turn this into a one-liner, because why not? So what happened? We take P, and we, um, well, and we unpack it. P is an option of A. We unpack it, and map option, if there is a value, will transform the value with F, and then repackage it. So we get an option of the transformation of A by F. But A gives us an option of B, so we have an option of option of B. So it means that P might have been empty already, but F might have, but also if, if P is not empty, F might still decide to give us an empty result, or a result with a transformation. So these are transformations with the that can add their own layer of structure. So now we have two layers of structure, the original one from P and whatever F decided to add. But we join them, because option is a monad. So we take these two layers of structures, like the, the two boxes, and we say it's okay because empty is empty. So if the first box is empty, it's cool. If the first box is full but the second is empty, we just treat it as an empty box. 
anyway. And if both are full, then we just take the result and put it in a normal box instead of a box with a box with a with a thing inside. Let's take a normal box with just one thing inside. That's that's what join does. Okay. So now I'm going to take this definition. I will move to option and I will state that option also is supposed to have a then function. And this then function, what does it do? Well, okay, first of all, the argument A we have already. And this is this. So we don't need it. And this is the return type. Okay, very good. Of course, this, this doesn't work yet out of the box. We have the two constructors, but here we can say, okay, what is... Uh, <coughs> uh, so what value do we give for them? Let's uh, say, okay, uh, as value, we have this function. This is the option of A upon which we called then. Uh, then I'm going to copy F. This is a little bit of a slightly verbose, mildly ugly uh, boilerplate. And then I pass this, I pass F, and this thing is happy. This is just boilerplate. There is no implementation whatsoever. This is just getting the right parameters and passing them to, um, to the method. But what can we do now with an option? Okay, so let's say that I have two... Well, let's define... Uh, 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 maybe add should be a function that takes as input two values, two numbers hidden inside an option, so possibly unavailable. Have uh, x and y. I want to add them together, but maybe they are not available at all. So how do I cope with this? Well, I can say x, then, and now this function f will be invoked with the value inside x if x contains such a value. So I will just call this uh, uh, xv, the value of x. Then I say, okay, next step, I will go through y. And I pass a function that will be invoked if y has a value with the value of y. And what do I do next? Now, I only hit line 316 if both x and y are full. And I have the values x underscore v and y underscore v. So here I can say, okay, now we repackage this in a full option with xv plus yv. And it works. <sighs> Some of you might notice. Problem 